Hello, is somebody there? I'm testing my microphone. Oh, Dee Dee, this is Christina. We're here. Oh, good, Christina. Uh, I'm, just... I'm so lame at this. Oh, you're doing great. So um, we're going to spend the next eight minutes just um, bringing people in, and then right around 7, Bob LaSalle will start the meeting. Okay, perfect. I'm tra practicing my first time on my computer also. Okay. So I'm. do you mind? I'm just going to look at my video to see what yeah. my... What what I might be like? Hi, <laughs> I'm so insecure about this whole thing. Oh, you're doing great. Uh, you don't have to keep your video on, or you can, but I do ask you to keep yourself muted unless you want to speak, because then we can um, make sure we don't have background video when we have our presentations. But actually, you're speaking now, so you can unmute yourself. <laughs> I remember I didn't know if I was muted before or not. <laughs> Um, and if I want to speak, um, raise my hand like Just this. Just raise your hand, yeah. Okay, yeah, Bob perfect. runs runs the meeting kind of a normal, you know, normal meeting, but we're all Excellent. virtual. Okay, uh, so when I do this, that's not me speaking. That's just me going, yay, round of okay. applause. You can check at your controls. There's a mute and a stop video. So mute, you just click on mute and you'll see an X will go through and you can unclick, take it out. Same thing with video. When you say stop video, it just means your video is done. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Dennis. How are you? Good. We're just letting everyone in. Okay. You have your earbuds on, but I can hear. <laughs> so should I leave them in my lap? Yeah. Huh? No, oh, God. I have the chicken dance stuck in my head and I really don't know why. And now um, I can't get it out. And I think it's because they're going, D -d 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 let's figure this out. <laughs> the process is not a good one here. <laughs> Hi, Christina. Uh, we're just waiting, getting everybody in. And then at about 7 o'clock, uh, Bob will start the meeting. And I'll um, let you share. I'll stop sharing my screen. And then you can share your screen. I just keep the agenda up as the background screen. Very good. Thank you. OK. And then just email me your presentation afterwards. And I'll send it to the group the next day. Sounds great. Thank you. OK.
Hello. How do I get my video to turn on? Uh, Linda, this is Christina. If you see, uh, do you see a mute and a stop video button at the kind of maybe bottom of your screen? You may have the stop video unclicked or clicked. You might want to try clicking and unclicking on that and see if that helps. Okay. Oh, I see you now. You know, I see your uh, chandelier. My, my chandelier. My life. <laughs> now I see your face. Okay. So. Okay, we are waiting for our illustrious chair, and we'll probably start in about two minutes. So thank you, everybody, for waiting. Good evening. Hello. Where is Bob? Oh, there's Bob. I'm here. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. I'm just, uh, uh, we have a couple more people in the waiting room trying to get them in. Okay. All right, so far I've gotten everyone in that's in the waiting room and I'll let people in as they come in, Bob, if you'd like to okay, start let's, the uh, meeting. Get this uh, CIC meeting of January 4th, 2021 is called to order. Uh, Dennis, would you please call the roll? Sure. Um, I'm looking at uh, 15 participants, uh, beginning with Barkley Hills, uh, Didi. Here. Uh, with Kanima, we have Linda. Yes. And myself. Uh, Caulfield, John Keyes. Here. Um, uh, Gaffney Lane, Amy. I'm here. Good. Um, McLaughlin, we have uh, Denise. No? Denise indicated, Dennis, that she would not be able to make it tonight. Okay. Uh, with Park Place, we have Steve. Here. And Bob, yes, here. And we have for the inactive group, we have uh, um, Hazel Grove, nobody, anybody? Uh, Hillendale and Rivercrest, we have Karen Morey. Here. South End, Tower Vista, we, Bob indicated a Jeff, is that correct? But I don't see a Jeff. And Two That's Rivers. Naked. Excuse me? Jeff Aiken. Aiken. Okay. And and Two Rivers. Uh, Margie was indicated. I don't know if we have it out there. Um, but that's it. Okay. Um, oh, Robert Malachow was um, approved to be the second representative CIC for um, Caulfield. I'm not sure if he's on or not. Uh, no, I don't have him on the list. His name again, John? Robert Mao Chow. Okay, thank you. And Dennis, Carla Laws just came in. Okay, Carla? <laughs> I'm here, thank you. Okay. 
Okay, good. I believe that's it. Um, is Ed Lindquist from Rivercrest on? No. No, okay. And uh, let's see here. Is Denise here? McGriff. And Tony Conkle? Okay. I just let Denise in. She's just logging in, Bob. Oh, Griff. okay. Thank you. Denise, welcome, Denise. Hi, everybody. Hang on a second here. Hi, good evening. Happy New Year, everybody. Thank you. Glad to see you aboard. Yep, the city computer was acting a little finicky. Oh, okay. All right. Well, we've easily got a forum tonight, so that'll take care of any voting that we might have come up. Um, we'll get right into presentations, and the first one this evening will be from Public Works. I think Vance Walker is the presenter tonight. Hey, good evening, everybody. Um, Vance Walker here. I'm the Assistant Public Works Director for the City of Oregon City. Um, I know some familiar faces there, Amy and William and Denise and Mike Mitchell and, of course, Bob. Uh, good to see you all. Um, so I've got a presentation. Uh, I've been told to keep it to about 15 minutes. So I will do my best to do so. Um, there are going to be three videos we're going to watch. Uh, during the videos, when I first start them, um, you may want to turn up your volume. When I tested the presentation out earlier with uh, one of my staff, uh, she could hear and see everything fine, but the videos are a little quiet. So please keep that in mind. Yeah. Okay. Yes, but I think the link is on that. The link is on that. All right, Christina, if we're ready, uh, am I good to go to share screen? You are good to go to share screen. Very good. Okay, can folks see my first slide there? Public Works update to the Citizen Involvement Committee. Yes, yes we can. Yes. Very good. Okay, again, uh, my name is Vance Walker. Uh, I've been here at Oregon City Public Works for two years and two days, exactly. Um, prior to here, I was the street supervisor for the city of Tigard. I was there about 12 years. Prior to that, city of Lake Oswego as a street and stormwater supervisor. So again, it's a pleasure to see some familiar faces and pleasure to uh, be able to do this presentation for the folks I've not met yet. Here's my agenda. We're gonna talk a little bit transportation, winter operations, and some project updates on Malala and Myers Road. Utilities, we're gonna talk a little bit about water. And we do have a, a video that uh, shows where our water comes from and what we do here in Public Works to, uh, to handle and, and treat the water. We've got a little bit to talk about stormwater. Give you a quick update on the First Street Operations Complex and then I'll touch on Mountain View Reservoir and Center Street Public Works operations. Okay, so here in Oregon City, we start preparing equipment and making sure we are stocked up in our materials, uh, usually in early November. Um, we test all of the equipment, make sure the deicer units run and spray make sure the snow plows go up and down, make sure the sanders kick, kick sanding rock out. On hand, we have uh, currently 7,600 gallons of magnesium chloride. That's what we use for our de-icing operations. To put that in perspective, at uh, putting it down at 17 gallons per lane mile, that's enough to treat 447 lane miles. We do have two tanks here on site. And when we start to get a little low, uh, we call in our contractor and, uh, and get them filled up. That tank is located here at our Center Street Operations Building, as is our sanding rock. We currently have about 100 cubic yards of sand. It's roughly 10, 10 dump truck loads. And for, for many years, most municipalities sand and plows were their only snow fighting equipment. 
uh, several years ago, magnesium chloride came, came on the scene here in Oregon. And it's the go-to product for uh, pre-application of roads to keep the black ice at bay. If we do have a freezing situation where we have black ice, the magnesium chloride is very effective at cutting through that black ice. We typically only try to use the sand and the plows when we have snow accumulation. The magnesium chloride does not cut through a large amount of snow. It can help break it up when it starts to slush up and we're plowing it off the road. But typically our first course of action is to pre-treat the roads if possible. The roads have to be dry to, to put down the magnesium chloride. If the roads are wet or if it's raining, the magnesium chloride just washes away as you might imagine. Our equipment, we've got two trucks with de-icer units. They're approximately 300 gallons a piece. We have two trucks of snow plows, and then we have three dump trucks with snow plows and sanders. In our equipment testing, we also go through our inventory of chains to make sure that we have chains for every, every truck. If we don't, or if we're running low, we make sure we supplement our inventory so we have sufficient chains and parts for the trucks. <clears throat> Any questions so far? Very good. Uh, we're gonna move on to a video. Um, Public Works, we've done a few of these videos to kind of showcase what we do here at Public Works. Um, this one is from our transportation division. And again, folks, uh, I'll start the video. Uh, please turn up your volume. And then when the video ends, uh, please turn your volume back down to where you had it. Okay. And uh, Bob, if you can just give me a thumbs up to let me know that you can hear and see the video, that'd be great. Okay, we'll do. So the street department- Can you see it? Uh, yeah. Facility workers, a team lead and myself. We can hear it. There's a weather event roll and we have to react to them at appropriately and at the appropriate time. A, a lot of what we do happens at three o'clock in the morning. We're, we're in here in the morning, in the dark, preparing these roads for the morning commute. Our tools for winter weather response include road closure for our steepest streets, de-icing, sanding, and plowing. The streets have to be mostly dry to apply magnesium chloride de-icer so the product won't dilute. That's why we don't apply when it's raining. The de-icer lowers the freezing temperature of water so the street can't form a layer of ice. Magnesium chloride is also effective on thin accumulation bridges. Sanding is most effective on hills and streets that need additional traction. Sand can be laid after plowing or during icing conditions. So the, the city is broken into priority routes, priority one, priority two, and priority three. Priority one streets will be the first ones for sanding and plowing. They're also the first ones for de-icing in an ice event. Priority one streets are our arterial streets that lead to the fire stations, to the hospitals, and moves traffic through town. Priority two streets are some arterials and some collectors. Those are next on the list. Then priority threes are mainly collector streets, once we have the priority ones, priority two and priority three streets under control, then we can get into the neighborhoods. The most dangerous period for driving is within the first six hours of a weather event. So when icy or snowy weather conditions exist, only drive if you absolutely need to. During wet or snowy conditions, it's important to accelerate and decelerate slowly and maintain a greater distance between you and other vehicles. Put tire chains on in your driveway before you leave and travel with an emergency kit with items such as warm clothing, a flashlight, an ice scraper, water, and food. People who are interested in seeing the road conditions prior to leaving their house uh, can check the ODOT trip check website. That's a good place to see the actual road conditions where you want to travel. Everything we do, whether it be closing roads down, or plowing this road, sanding that road, is all safety in mind for our residents. It's, sometimes it's an inconvenience, we understand that, but it's for everybody's safety. Safety is our number one focus during a winter event. OK, 
Okay, very good. Uh, moving on, uh, a couple quick updates. Molal Avenue Streetscape Project. It's uh, been going full swing for several months now. Um, you know, our focus is really to keep the corridor open for business, uh, pedestrian activities, TriMat vehicle access. Um, there is another way around using Beaver Creek Road that we uh, encourage people to do. When it comes to nighttime closures, um, the project team is working hard to limit night work, and allowing it when it's- he's, he's, I'm, this is just kind of off. This is what I had a problem here. Your internet connection is unstable. Someone seems to have their uh, microphone on. Oh, that's me. Okay, we good to go folks? Mm -hmm. Great. Um, again, uh, we're, we're only, we're working hard to limit night work, only allowing it when absolutely necessary. Um, you know, the travel impacts during the project, two lanes on Malala, no center turn lane, uh, bikes on the road with vehicles, and we've got four-way stops at Claremont, Gaffney, and Fur. Construction completion is slated for November 2021. Um, as you can see, overhead utility work continues. There's an 18-inch transmission water main that's being installed, and that'll help increase capacity and maintain redundancy in our water system. The basalt seat walls are being constructed currently. Stage two, beginning this month, moves traffic to the east side of Malala. For more information, um, please feel free to reach out to myself or Brian Van Smorenberg at that email address. Myers Road, it's open. It's pretty impressive if you have not driven it yet. Um, landscaping is still occurring in the uh, stormwater planter areas. But so far, things are indicating that it's functioning very well and was a very needed piece of infrastructure. Another video here. The City of Oregon City is proud to announce the completion and opening of the Myers Road Extension Project. This new thoroughfare allows for safer connections for motor vehicles, bicycles, and pedestrians traveling along Myers Road. The new road will help alleviate peak hour congestion and provide greater access to the industrial land located within the Beaver Creek employment area, which is intended to foster development of living wage jobs. You will experience roadway improvements such as buffered bike lanes, additional on-street parking, street trees, street lighting, and ADA accessible sidewalks. The project has added an additional lane northbound on Highway 213 at Myers Road, as well as a new traffic light at Highway 213 and Myers Road. We are grateful to have Oregon City School District support as the Myers Road Extension provides access to the Oregon City School District Transportation and Maintenance Facility. This project could not have been possible without our partnership with Clackamas Community College and their $2.6 million contribution to this $9.8 million project. Hello, my name is Dr. Tim Cook and I'm the president of Clackamas Community College. I'm pleased to take part in celebrating the completion of the Myers Road Extension. Back in 2014, the voters of Clackamas County approved a $90 million bond measure that allowed us to construct three brand new buildings and expand another, along with other critical improvements to our campuses. As part of the bond package, the college agreed to partner with Oregon City to extend Myers Road and add a third entrance to the college, which should help alleviate traffic impacts as our college continues to grow. We are naming our new ent entrance to the college Kaiser Way, in dedication to a long-serving former CCC president, Dr. John Kaiser, who served for 16 years, from 1985 to 2001. As a president who worked tirelessly to create paths for students to enter college, it is fitting that we are naming our new entrance after Dr. Kaiser. CCC has been part of the city of Oregon City since 1966, and we take pride in continuing to be an integral part of the community. We want to thank the Clackamas Community College, Oregon City School District, and our community and travelers for their patience for the construction of this exciting project and hope that this project has a positive impact on your travel in and around Oregon City. All right, folks, if there's no questions, I'll move on to our utility report. 
I would make uh, one couple of comments, Vance. Yes, sir. Could you give us a couple of examples of the winter road closures? Yes. Um, uh, Center Street, before it drops down uh, from Telford, that typically gets closed. And then I believe 15th, which is the very steep hill if you come off Washington, um, that one gets closed. Uh, Mr. LaSalle, I know there's a couple more and uh, they're escaping me uh, right now. Those are the two big ones. Um, I wanna say potentially on Pearl, there is a very steep area also. What about Washington? Uh, we typically leave Washington open um, and that's one of our first priorities to de-ice and or sand and plow. Okay, and uh, then I'd like to just make one comment. For years and years, I was a service technician in the heating and air conditioning business. And so I learned how to drive in the snow and ice. One tip that is typically not given out to people, I don't know why, is that when you're driving in the snow and ice, if you're coming to a stop to put your automatic transmission in neutral, mm -hmm. and that uh, makes a huge difference in your stopping ability and steering ability because then the rear wheels are no longer trying to, to force the vehicle forward. Yeah. Yes, that's very, that's very true, especially on older vehicles. Um, some of the newer vehicles with their electronic controls, uh, analog braking and traction controls are, aren't as bad at that, but that's a very good point, Bob. Mr. Chair, I have a couple of questions, if I may. Uh, I also have a question. Would you like to go first, Amy? No, go ahead. Uh, Vance, two questions. One is, uh, despite the really fine job you guys are doing on Molala, uh, it's still a little, um, it's still a little treacherous to, uh, to uh, maneuver at times. And I'm wondering, have there been any accidents reported yet? Um, not that I know of. Uh, That's great news, Mr. Gifford. Um, not that I know of. That's not to say that you know there's you know not been a fender bender, but I've just not yeah. been informed. That's good news. Second question is, how do you feel that we're doing on budget for that Molala project? That would be a question better posed to uh, uh, the engineer, project engineer Brian Van Smornberg with Dana. Um, okay. You know, uh, it, although it's a huge project, and my operations staff are going to inherit what's being built, uh, I'm, I'm not really privy to uh, how they're doing budget-wise, but I'd be more happy to follow up for you. Thank you. You bet. Vance, that great map that you showed us about the priorities for the de-icing. Yes. Is that available online? I am not able to find it online, so. It, it, it will be. We typically wait to put that on the city website uh, until we get close to having an event. Interesting, okay. Thank you. You bet. Okay, moving forward, I'm one minute over, so I'm gonna go through this somewhat quickly. Uh, water, um, this came from Patty Nelson, uh, one of our engineers working here at Oregon City. Um, I know John Lewis uh, updated you the master plan amendment and land use approval, 1214 with the planning commission. Uh, the update is this was recommended for approval and will go to the commission January 20th. Information can be found on the planning website. Uh, also, uh, there's been a lot of discussion on uh, water uh, system development charges, SDCs, um, being modified to help uh, support the, the capital projects. And as you all probably know, the SDCs pay for the infrastructure needed uh, to support the growth of our city. Again, Patty Nelson uh, would be the person best to answer any questions on that, or you can throw them at me and I'll follow up. And I'm gonna skip this video and move to wastewater storm. Uh, our INI, Inflow and Infiltration Program, River Crest Basin. The closed caption TV work is underway. Uh, contractors performing that work for the city. Uh, Central West engineers are providing design assessments, bidding services, construction, late summer, early fall, 21. The rehabilitation, 14,000 feet of mainline, 38 manholes, 214 sewer laterals. The rehabilitation will include trenchless methods such as uh, pipe bursting, cured in place lining, uh, directional drilling for main lines and laterals. Uh, 
and traditional open trench if needed. As for the manholes, uh, we're open to use various technologies out there for rehab, or we may just replace the manhole if it's more cost effective and will give us a better product in the end. To give you an idea where this is, because uh, I had to look it up today too. So if you imagine uh, Lynn Avenue, basically from the big intersection at War Warner Parrot, Leland, Warner Millie, past the new police station. So Lynn Avenue, um, Donald Street, A.B. Davis, Holmes, McCarver, Narain Court, Ethel, Hood Street, Randall, and a couple other streets. So, but that's the area of the basin that we're talking about. Uh, facilities. Um, I know you saw this slide in November. Um, First Street Operations Complex. Here are some current pictures uh, taken in the month of December. Um, lots of site work, lots of trenching for plumbing inside the warehouse and inside what used to be the office building. From left to right, you see the big excavator boom. That's actually in the warehouse uh, area digging out. Next picture, that's plumbing going through the warehouse towards the office. Big pump truck, uh, lots of foundation and lots of footing work have occurred. And the, the last picture on the right, uh, you can see the footings already poured and this is a foundation wall going up. Uh, the reason I want to bring up Center Street, so as awesome as a facility as First Street's going to be, it's a little small. The office is not small and the warehouse is not small. We're lacking in yard space. So currently, as I mentioned here at Center Street, we have our sanding rock, our de-icer. We have a decant facility, um, which we do not have room to program those in at uh, First Street. We also have uh, quite a bit of parks equipment and wastewater storm pipes and parts. And most of our water department's inventory is at Mountain View and will, con and will continue to be there. Um, because of COVID, I've got a job shack uh, up there at Mountain View and that's where our water division reports currently. So hopefully uh, September, October of this year when we're moved to First Street, COVID will be under control and I can have my, my water guys back with me because I kind of miss them but don't tell them that. <laughs> okay, and finally, um, Dana Webb, our city engineer, wanted me to include this slide. So ODOT, Oregon City, Westland, Clackamas County Metro are, are doing a, a feasibility study. And basically it's to identify up to five potential pedestrian and bicycle bridge locations and provide opportunities for community and local agencies to reimagine a new crossing. Uh, the project team, and community will review the potential locations and understand the benefits and burdens of each location. The preferred location would, would then be incorporated into local transportation system plans. You may have heard um, recently, one of the options folks are, are pondering is the conversion of the arch bridge to bike and pedestrian only. There's been no decisions made, but it will be included uh, in the in these five potential options. I think most importantly, if you'd like more information, um, there's gonna be a presentation to the city commission on January 6th. Uh, ODOT will be making that presentation as I understand. And that does it folks, I'm sorry I went over Bob. Well, that's okay Vance, it's uh, with questions and whatnot, it's not unusual. And uh, uh, Christina, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. Oh, and by the way, that's a that picture of the Arch Bridge, 1922 is when that was taken. I thought that was a cool picture. Does anybody have any questions in advance? All right. Hey, thank you very much, everybody. I really do appreciate the opportunity to present for you. I really do. Um, I'm pretty easy to get a hold of and, and really easy to find. A couple of you already have me on speed dial. And uh, please feel free to reach out uh, with any other questions. And that'll do it. Okay, thank you, Ant. Great, thank you all very much. Our next presentation is a Historic District Review Process by Planner Kelly Reed.
Hi, everybody. Um, thanks so much for having me tonight. I'm going to share my screen if I can, Christina. And thanks, Bob, for uh, making room on your agenda. Always happy to have you. Let me see if I can share now. Okay. Can everyone see that? Yep. Yes. Great. Okay, uh, so we're calling this project Compatible Change, and um, it involves mostly the McLaughlin Conservation District, but also the Kanema Historic District. Um, and so uh, we're kind of in the middle of the process um, gathering public input, and so now's a great time to talk to CIC. Um, kind of, I would like to run the our public engagement plan by you to see if you have any suggestions for more that we could do or other folks that we could reach out to as part of this process um, and then get your feedback on um, the project itself and, and what we're trying to do. Um, so what this project is, um, is a, uh, another, a review of the thresholds for historic review um, for certain types of work in the historic districts. Um, so right now we've got two districts, Kanema National Register, McLaughlin Conservation District. In Kanema, you have historic homes and non-historic homes, but we treat them the same as, when, as far as review is required. If, if, if someone's gonna make changes to their home, um, uh, the Historic Review Board generally will, will review that. Um, if they're building an addition, for example. In McLaughlin, it's different. Um, we have designated structures and non-designated structures. And if it's non-designated, then uh, it's not subject to any historic review unless new construction is occurring on that property. And the way we define new construction is 30% addition or, or greater, or a new detached structure that's more than 200 square feet. So like a new detached garage, for example, or a large addition on that house, that would trigger HRB review. And even though that property is not designated as a historic structure, uh, the historic review board would still um, be reviewing that, uh, you know, the design of what's being proposed. Um, so in McLaughlin, um, only about a third, just a little over a third of the buildings in the district are designated, the rest are non-designated. Um, so if we do change the review threshold on this, then it will affect, um, directly affect those uh, 553 non-designated properties in McLaughlin. Um, so the problem that we're trying to solve is that the current threshold um, and the definition for new construction is kind of vague. It's not well defined in the code and it, there are some holes um, that, that we'd like to fill. Um, so th the result of the current code is that there are some remodeling projects um, that could really change, change the character and the appearance of a structure quite dramatically um, that don't get captured by this historic uh, review threshold. And here's just an example of that. I don't want to single out, I, I hate to single out, you know, specific properties, but this, I think this picture just um, really defines the problem uh, pretty well. Um, you have a small, you know, compatible home in the district and then a, uh, what's, what's defined as a remodel through kind of a loophole in the code ends up with a, a structure that's almost twice the height of the original. And um, it, I would say if, if the board had reviewed this, they might not um, have approved that exact new design. Um, and so we don't wanna keep people from, from making additions or you know, improving their homes or um, building in the district. We, we wanna encourage all of that, but we just wanna make sure it's done in a compatible fashion. Uh, so, the other part of this project is a major public improvements. Uh, those are, you know, public investments in the in the historic districts. So streetscape projects, um, new buildings, uh, you know, new parks or park improvements within the historic district. And right now, the code requires that the historic review board review and approve those as well. Um, but the the definition is vague. So. Uh, you could argue that a new traffic signal requires HRB review um, or a new sign, uh, for example, because it's a public investment government spending, you know, in the district. Um, so we want to kind of be more specific about what really the historic review board needs to review and what they don't. 
Um, examples, uh, Lauderette Park uh, in, the, in McLaughlin, that recently went before the board. Um, that was really just landscaping and kind of pavement changes and so, uh, some playground equipment um, uh, at that park and, and the board looked at that. Um, the 7th Street uh, Streetscape project um, many years ago in 2004, um, that went before the board. And then, you know, any work um, on the McLaughlin Promenade, for example, uh, we probably want to review any changes to that. Um, there was recently a sign proposed uh, for the Oregon Film Trail that uh, also went to the Historic Review Board for review. Um, so it, you know, for public projects, it adds a little bit of red tape, but then it also ensures compatibility. And so we want to just make sure we get the right balance there. Uh, so the community engagement that we're doing includes in, uh, interviews with individuals. Um, and I actually, I want to, I wanna pause and just mention that we have um, some funding from the state through a certified local government status. Uh, so we get some grant funding every couple of years and we are using grant funding to pay an intern, um, a, a very, very capable um, uh, graduate student at Portland State um, who's working with the city uh, to do a lot of this community engagement. Um, if we did not have that resource of that grant, we would not be able to hire this person and we would not be able to do this much public engagement. Um, so this, the reason we're getting all this long list of community engagement is because we have this extra funding and we're able to hire someone who um, does a great job. So um, he's been uh, conducting interviews with individual stakeholders. Um, we held a focus group uh, with public uh, city staff. Um, we have been making presentations to neighborhood associations and CIC. Uh, we're posting an online poll on the city website. Um, it's going live this week. Uh, we're reaching out by social media. We're also going to um, send a postcard or mailer to um, everyone in the districts, um, including property owners and residents. Uh, and we're holding a virtual open house February 10th to kind of share some recommendations and get some feedback on those recommendations. Um, and the timeline, uh, sorry for the formatting here, but um, we, we've done a lot of research already. Uh, we reached out to other municipalities to see how they handle this. So in some places, um, they look at, uh, for example, if a, a non-designated structure is getting a, some remodeling done, um, is the height increasing? If so, they review it. If not, it doesn't get reviewed. Um, you know, that's one way to, to do it. Um, we rely on the 30% of area um, currently and, you know, maybe we could look at height or maybe we could look at just a, right, a, a flat number of square feet of addition. Um, uh, so we, we kind of got a lot of good ideas from other jurisdictions. Um, we've begun to interview stakeholders and, um, and other folks. We've drafted some evaluation criteria that I'll share with you in a minute. Um, we're going to continue that community engagement until our open house in February. And after we have that, we expect to have, you know, have, um, hopefully people will coalesce around a recommendation uh, and we can go to the historic review board with that recommendation. And then um, that would translate into some code amendments that would then go to the city commission. Um, so about the draft evaluation criteria, you know, this is probably going to result in some code changes. Um, we want those code changes to kind of hit these four items. First is provide clarity. Um, we want it to be clear to the property owners, to the city staff, um, and to the public. So there's no confusion over, you know, how do you measure 30% area? You know, was that a remodel or not? Um, we want the rules to be clear to everybody. Two, uh, we want to respect staff time. Um, we have very limited staff in the planning department and any, uh, we need any new code language um, to be able to be implemented using existing staff time. Um, so we can't add a whole lot of process or new application types um, that would take a lot more time for staff. Um, we don't want to overburden uh, property owners. So uh, we want to respect that these structures in McLaughlin are not designated as historic structures. Um, but we, uh, you know, they are in the district, but they're not designated. And so we want to respect that and not overburden those folks with additional regulations. 
Um, and then, of course, we want to maintain historic integrity. Uh, so the balance there is um, maintaining compatibility in the district, ensuring that uh, the changes that folks want to make to their projects, um, when they're significant, uh, that they do come before the board and the board has a chance to make sure that those uh, that that the work that's being done is compatible in the district. So my questions for you are, um, who do you think needs to be part of this process? Who else should we reach out to? Um, any feedback that you have on the evaluation criteria and then any questions that you have? I have a question for you, Kelly. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, you said who else should we reach out to, but I don't know who your individual stakeholders are. And I was wondering who are those individual stakeholders and how did you determine that they are um, a stakeholder? Yeah, so uh, we've spoken to um, some residents of McLaughlin, um, of Kanema, people involved in the neighborhood associations, um, a contractor uh, that you know does this kind of work on people's homes, um, former and current historic review board members, um, city staff, so like folks from public works department that that and the parks department, you know, that are making these public improvements within the districts. Um, and I'm trying to think if there was anybody else, um, it, you know, so we're open to, you know, other, I, oh, and um, we talked with Todd Eislin, uh, who's an architect um, that do, who he does a lot of work for property owners in the district as well. Um, so we're trying to get people who kind of have an idea of the types of um, work that people want to do on, on their homes in the district. Um, and then, you know, people who are more directly involved in that, but then also just folks who have an interest in keeping the character of the district. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, so, um, I have noticed in the Kanema area when there's a building, it takes an extremely long time to build a home in Kanema. These are generally individual homes. Um, the length of time costs the builders money. Time is money. And the higher cost of this drives up the cost of the homes and making them unaffordable. Um, I'm sure that would also be true in the McLaughlin neighborhood. So kind of runs away with it, uh, of not having affordable housing. How do you feel, is that what you, how do you feel this is going to um, incorporate what you're desiring to do? The high um, yeah. Well, I, thanks, Linda. That's uh, I, I agree that the construction in Kanema sometimes can last a long time. And I think a lot of that has to do with also the geologic hazard overlay um, and all the um, rules that need to be followed for that. Um, this project is not related at all to new construction um, in the district. So if a new home is being built um, in Kanema or McLaughlin, we're not that this project isn't really um, looking at new buildings, but only the uh, existing structures that are not designated and you know what's happening with those. Um, the public improvements, uh, if it's a new building, um, it's gonna go through the same new construction review that already exists and we're not looking to change that system or those guidelines. Um, so I don't think Linda that this project is going to really make a difference as far as how long construction takes, um, knowing that time is money. Um, it, it, I suppose it could uh, affect someone's timeline if they have a non-designated structure in McLaughlin and they have to you know, do or don't have to go through a process if they wanna make an addition to that. Uh, Kelly, have you included any business organizations in your stakeholders group? Um, other than the contractors and architects, no, uh, we have not yet. I have a question. Go ahead, Dennis. <laughs> um, with respect to the review and the process of like 
a questionnaire. I'm, I'm anxious for this uh, meeting on the Feb, February 10th, the feedback. Um, I, I like the third uh, category, that paragraph on uh, overburdening the process. I like that a lot. I like that consideration. Uh, living in an area which is it both period, they're out of period houses as well as historic buildings. And that's, a, as you know, is an ongoing issue. Um, and, I, and I think uh, drafting and reviewing this uh, process is a very good one and timely. Added to which, and the question that I wanted to pose was like, I think with all that's going on with this kind of like uh, energy, there should be some kind of review to assist those people within those areas, certainly in Kanema, where buildings seem to be deteriorating and are, are subject to like questionable. I mean, there are some buildings, as I understand, in our area that have no, they have no uh, foundation. I mean, in terms of it's right to the ground that it's been built. So should that be sold? Should that be remodeled? Uh, it imposes a great deal of some of these restrictive codes that now exist. And if without any kind of like financial aid or assist, since we are a district that has a, uh, a belief in the historic preservation, there might be some kind of uh, effort, at least I would think, to try and bring in funds that would help these people with their historic homes to you know, pick, make them compatible and update them and bring them into a modern frame of thought and enhance the, the greater whole of the neighborhood. And that's never a discussion that gets talked about. It's always the, the, the banter between the two extremes. And if we're gonna go through the process of this uh, review, I think that should be a consideration on finding resources to assist people in updating their windows, their, uh, their roof, and siding, uh, and a number of other things. So I just wanna put that in play. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, Dennis. We do have a preservation grant program. We offer grants to for foundation repair, for example, um, historic window repair. It's not a lot of money though. Um, so it helps a little bit, but it's not gonna make a dent in um, a, a, a large foundation project. I know those can be really um, pricey, but um, I think that uh, I'll shout out to Christina and Pete here because that actually sounds like a great topic or suggestion um, for the um, comprehensive plan update um, that, that they're working on. Um, so hopefully we can capture that um, in, in that project as well. Thank you. Kelly, Karen Mori had her hand up. Karen, did you still want to ask a question? Karen, you're muted in case you're uh, talking. Sorry. There we go. Um, I need to do away with my nine month self isolation and come next door and talk to you too. Uh, I've been trying to follow this. Uh, this was an interesting presentation. It, you know, the McLaughlin neighborhood was originally two story houses on probably two lots per block, which was eight lots. That house that you showed going from a single story to a double story was a cottage to a vernacular between 1890 and 1920. Um, a lot of the big old houses were torn down and the cottage housing was built because we needed housing for workers. This needs to take into consideration the evolution of the McLaughlin neighborhood, not just what somebody's view of point in time in the McLaughlin neighborhood looks like. Um, I would love to work with you on more of that. I'm happy it's being addressed. And, you know, Kanema is a slightly different issue but it has some similarities with evolution of design. So um, I'll be back to you. <laughs> Thanks, Karen, I'll reach out. Looks like Dee Dee, you raised your hand. Yeah, this kind of goes back to a little bit of Dennis's um, question about how we um, help people. 
I know that my house was it turned the century house and it was built probably six inches from ground level. Um, it doesn't look like a, a historical home at all now, but it, it, it was built in 1910 or registered then. But I know that I gained most of my things like foundation, siding, insulation over periods of years um, and when programs developed even to paint my home and stuff through the Clackamas Community Development Division. And those programs and also other city programs are, are historical homes um, eligible for that? Or is that always income based and or neighborhood based? You know, I, mean, I that was one thing because I know that that was, I mentioned that a lot in the burden, rent burden thing, because that helps a lot of people get a leg up and things that they can't afford. Just a question. Um, are you, is this the community development block grant program? Not, uh, no, I, it, they were saying, how do we get people a leg up to get their windows yeah. done and painting? Right, right. And you I mentioned community development, Clackamas community yeah, development. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, those, that was the way that I know I did a lot of things on mm -hmm. my home when I needed mm -hmm. And I, yeah. I don't even know if that it, it even exists anymore, but um, I think okay. very, but I'm just was wondering if historical homes are approved for that also. Yeah, I think um, another yeah. good thought, yeah, that I, I don't know of a program like that now, um, but. Yeah, those, those are, those are excellent programs and I, and I, and like recently, I think they had uh, some for heaters and, and furnaces for people's homes. Anyway, those are ways that people can really get help. Mm -hmm. um, upgrade. Thanks. Oh, can I ask one other question? Because I'm really lame at this. You guys all know I'm pretty new. Um, but Kelly, if, I, if we wanted to explore historical districts um, up, up in the Ely area, how would we do that? Hmm. Um, the Ely. I can call you later. I'll also, I could do this at another. Yeah. Okay. Um, remind me what part of the Ely area is. At Barclay Hills. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we oh, can talk later. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can call you later on it. That, that would be. I just put my interest with all of this. Or DP call Karen. <laughs> I didn't hear any of that. Any other questions for Kelly? Denise has been waving her hand. Yeah, I don't have a, uh, we don't have a hand raised thing on this. So yes, I, I don't have a question, but I wanted to, um, I wanted to basically just speak up and, and uh, commend the staff for moving this uh, as far as they have to this point. Um, I would like to suggest that there be some changes to the criteria, valuation criteria, because I think overburden is a very negative term. And I think whatever we do when we're promoting something like this, or we're talking about changes that we use positive words to emphasize what we are trying to do. Um, you, you know, you catch more flies with honey that way, that type of thing. So I would like to suggest that, but I, um, I really appreciate your bringing this uh, to the CIC for them to uh, basically take a look at. I know not, uh, it doesn't affect a lot of them, but um, we do have, as, as Kelly stated, two really awesome historic districts in our city. And uh, as Karen knows, they are uh, part of our pride and joy along with many other parts of our city, but they are, you know, they're, they're the beginning of where our town started. And then Kanema being its own town to begin with, and then coming into Oregon City has a lot of significance for the evolution of our community. So thank you very much for uh, moving this forward. Thanks, Sounds Steve. like William raised his hand too. Go ahead, William. Thank you very much. That if you want to raise your hand, there is a, there is a way of doing that, uh, Commissioner, by clicking the participants button at the bottom of the screen if you're using a desktop. Underneath all the names of the participants, there's an option that's a little blue hand where you can raise your hand in that way. I know, it's not there. Are you on a desktop or a laptop? I'm on a laptop. Yeah, there, there, sh there should be, um, uh, if you mouse over the bottom of the screen where it shows participants, share screen, record and reactions, Yes, I know, William. I, I've already been, I've already looked for it. It does, it is not on this particular machine. Okay. And I, 
using my own computer. So thank you, but anyway, I appreciate it. Let's, let's uh, move on here to, so we don't use the Citizens Involvement Committee meeting for a tutorial. William, did you have further comments? Nope, just trying to help. Thank you. Any other and, questions for Kelly? And, uh, Bob, you mentioned businesses. If you have any suggestions um, of people who you think we should talk to or businesses, um, feel free to send them to me and we'll, we'll reach out. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kelly. That was very informative. Uh, our next uh, section is public comments. And we have two listed. I would like to, at this point, reach out to see if there are any other public comments before we get to those. Do you have any, Christina? I do not. Okay, item uh, three is from Mike Mitchell City Committee Appointments. Mike, go ahead. Are, are there gonna be committee uh, citizen comments? Pardon me? Are there going to be citizen comments? That's what I'm wait, wait. That's what I'm asking for now. Oh well, that's why I signed up. I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead then, William. We'll do you first before we get to these ones that are listed. Thank you. Um, I I know that uh, it's near and dear to many of your hearts about the uh, about reactivating inactive neighborhood associations, and I know you have an item on this on the agenda later for that. But I wanted to let you know what Hillendale and Tara Vista are doing is that we have been, we've accumulated uh, email addresses over the last 10 years or so from various sources. And we have, um, and I did some strategizing with Laura Turway and she agrees that we can do some Zoom meetings. And so we have set up a Zoom account for all the neighborhood associations we have a Gmail account, uh, which is OregonCityNA at gmail.com, where we can distribute information that should be available to all the neighborhood associations that want it. And uh, we are having our first uh, joint Zoom meeting of uh, Hillendale and Tara Vista tomorrow evening. And we went ahead and, and purchased a, a years long Zoom account which I think is gonna be a lot more effective and uh, less ex certainly less expensive than sending out letters and postcards. So, uh, and I think that the emphasis that we are trying to get across is reactivating neighborhood associations first and encouraging involvement in the, uh, in the CIC as the next step. I know, for example, that Caulfield Association went for quite a while as a very active neighborhood association with no CIC involvement. And then they, they, uh, they joined the CIC and I think are even more effective now. But the point is that I think that at the grassroots level that we need to begin with the, uh, with the neighborhood associations. And if that's possible, and I did read the, uh, the letter that apparently um, uh, Commissioner McGriff uh, helped edit. Uh, it's a much better edit, but it starts in with the CIC. And I'm just recommending that we start in at the neighborhood level, and that's why we got this other thing started. And I'll stop talking. Thank you, William. That's good information. And of course, we always have to have the neighborhood organized before they can assign anybody to the CIC. So it certainly makes sense uh, the sequence that you mentioned. Any further comments from anybody? Got a question for us. So right now the Hillendale is actually inactive. So you said you're holding a joint meeting. How do you do that if it's not an active neighborhood? Just question. Well, you can have a meeting without being a neighborhood association. You can have a group of people. I spent uh, three years, as you well know, Amy, uh, along, with, uh, along with Chris uh, Wadsworth and, uh, and Betty Mom and went around to every neighborhood association. They, they weren't active, and yet we had meetings. They didn't sure, have sure. elected officers, and yet we had meetings. And so we had meetings in order to activate it. It's kind of a chicken the egg thing. You, you ask, how can you have a, a meeting without an active organization? You've got to start someplace. 
And so we just wanted to get started. I guess my, I was more to the, sorry, I didn't quite word it right. Um, you were saying that you were spending money on a, on a Zoom account? That, that account has been set up and it is available to any neighborhood association that wants to use it. What funds were used to set it up? Laura Turway took care of that. So Christina, I question how that was funded. Nope, sorry. Uh, the request was sent a couple weeks ago to look at the postcard budget and looking at in general, there was a lot of money left in the postcard budget. And Laura Torrey indicated that the, I think it was like a hundred and something dollars could be used for any neighborhood association that wants to use uh, a Zoom link. And so William has started off and what I'd like to do, William, if you could send me the information I can forward that on to the, all the neighborhood association contacts in an email. But doesn't the CIC have to approve those funds to be spent? I, I don't know. <laughs> I can check back on with you. Because um, I, I can understand how, um, and I'm not saying this is a bad idea, just trying to make sure we're crossing our T's and dotting our I's that if money's being spent, um, I could see how Tower Vista has a chair who could um, spend their money, but if, if Hillendale's marked as inactive, I would hope that funds are being asked of the CIC, just like Bob has asked for funds to send the letters. Um, Amy, I, I hope can, we're not yeah, I can check in with, system. no, I can check in with Laura. I think the, the fee was so low and it was open to all the neighborhoods. So I think that was her thinking, but I can check back in with her and respond back to you. Well, yeah, and so low doesn't really matter. I mean, I had to get approval to spend $80 on a sign. So I guess it's relative. It's just a matter of following the same procedures every time. Sure thing. I'll check back in with her. Okay. And Christina, this is Karen. I'm with Amy. Um, we have an expended funds in Rivercrest that I would have been happy to say, yes, use part of this. But yes, your representatives need to be consulted before funds are expended. And I, this is the first I'm hearing that we could buy a Zoom account. So I, that's just a surprise to me. Uh, to give a follow up about November, I think uh, I did uh, provide information to the CIC that we were supportive of any neighborhood association who wanted to spend their postcard money on a Zoom account or joint Zoom account. And I think uh, with William moving forward, Laura thought that as a good opportunity for the uh, uh, for to move forward with a uh, Zoom account for neighborhood associations, but I can double check with her. And I think that makes sense if uh, Hillendale is formally inactive, then this is something that the CIC can move forward and make a vote on at the next meeting. Or uh, if a neighborhood association that is active wants to identify their money to be spent on behalf of all the neighborhoods, that can be done as well. So I'll look for the direction of the CIC on this. Yes, the question, I mean, we all love w William. That's The question would just be if anybody from that neighborhood came forward and said, I want to spend this money, you know, so that I guess that's my question is there's there's a reason that we have procedures to mm -hmm. go through. Not that we question William because, yeah, he got me involved. I, I appreciate his hard work on this. That's not the, that's not the issue. Makes perfect well, sense. I, I agree with what Amy says is that, uh, you know, thank you very much, William, for your efforts in doing that. And I would like to be included in the invite for tomorrow's meeting, if possible. Yeah. Uh, but again, since the CIC represents in land use issues any of the inactive neighborhoods, I would think that that should also go forward in the expenditure of any of their funds. Uh, if nothing more, than just a courtesy uh, notification or request. Just to get verification, isn't Zoom free unless it's over 45 minutes? Is that correct? Yes. We've been using an app called Jitsi, it's spelled J I T period S E, where you go in and download an app. If you have a phone, you name a room. And whatever room you name, it creates a URL link, it creates a phone number for people to call in. It's completely free and it's done wonderful for us here in Barclay Hills. 
I can I, second I, that. I was just wondering if we were going to get charged if we went over 45 minutes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, the next item in public comments would be item three, city committee appointments, Mike Mitchell. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for letting me have some time. My name is Mike Mitchell. Uh, I'm an Oregon city resident. And uh, I think I know pretty much everybody on the meeting, not everybody, but it was it was pretty close as I kept track. Um, for those of you that, that don't know, um, uh, I've served on the CIC a couple of terms. Uh, I was Amy's vice chair one year and uh, several other advisory committees. Presently, for the last two years, I've been chair of the planning commission. And I want to make it clear uh, tonight that I'm speaking only for myself and not for the planning commission. This is, this is just me. Um, when I started going over my notes, I realized that uh, it, it sounds like I'm, I'm trying to uh, you know, set myself up as, as the expert and, and solve what I see as a couple of problems. But I want to make it clear that all I'm hoping to do is get these two items on the radar uh, of our city government, get them on the citizens' radar, and hopefully get the CIC behind the idea of starting a public process to change our charter related to these two items. I'm not trying to uh, tell you this has to be the solution. So uh, please don't please don't take it that way. I do have ideas what I think would be better and, I, and I'll mention those, but uh, I just wanna be clear that what I'm trying to do is is start the process. And, and why now? Let me talk about that just for a second. Uh, a couple of reasons. First, I think that Oregon City citizens are very interested in what is happening in their city government right now. And I think that was evidenced by the number of votes that were cast uh, in the recall election and how that election turned out. I think people are looking for openness uh, and equality and inclusion in our city government. And that was clear from that vote. And the other reason why I think now is the right time on these two actions is uh, one of them relates to how we elect city commissioners. And we're as far away as possible from the next round of city commission elections um, so it kind of takes the personalities out of it a little bit, takes the uh, politics out of it. Um, the two ideas, and I'm going to, they're listed here separately, but I'm going to kind of talk about them in one chunk here. Um, the first one is how we fill the volunteer seats on our boards and commissions. And presently, those seats are filled by the mayor. And uh, I know there's at least one person on this meeting and probably more uh, who uh, may have been victims of uh, uh, situations where they were not appointed to a position and not necessarily for the right reasons. I believe, and people that I've talked to about these ideas, these are not new ideas. I've been talking about them for at least a couple of years when I ran for city commission a couple of years ago. Um, that it would be much better for some or all of our boards and commissions to be appointed by the entire city commission. And I say some or all because there's a bit of a difference. I certainly, my opinion and, and people that I've talked to, the planning commission and the historic review board should definitely be appointed by the entire city commission instead of just by the mayor. Reason being, those two bodies make decisions that directly affect people's lives. The other boards and committees are advisory in nature. And so there is a, there's a bit of a trade-off in terms of um, the time that our volunteer city commissioners, which every, which every, everything that they have on their plate, um, does it make sense for them to be involved on advisory committees? I, I don't know the answer to that. But certainly in terms of the planning commission and the historic review board. That's the, the first idea. The other idea relates to how we elect city commissioners. We now elect commissioners, as you know, we elect them, people file for a position and they run against the other people that file for that position. But those positions don't report to, they don't represent a ward or a district 
or a subset of our city, they represent everyone in the city. So with our current system, the possibility exists that the two individuals who might be Oregon City citizens' favorite two candidates are running against each other, and so they can't both be elected. Uh, I believe that we can guarantee that we always elect the two people that our citizens would want the most by having anyone who wants to file for city commission files for commission, not for a specific position. There's one list. Generally, every two years, there will be two open seats. So every voter would get two votes. And the two people that get the most two votes get the two seats. Again, to me, it, it eliminates the idea that uh, the one and two candidates in people's minds might be running against each other and therefore can't both be elected. Um, a bit of background on these, both of these ideas would require a charter revision and charter revisions in our city, as you probably know, require a vote of the people. Charter revisions can be put on the ballot either by an initiative, which is not easy to do and particularly not easy to do in the time of our pandemic, uh, or they can be placed on the ballot by the city commission. And that's what I'm hoping we can do. Um, I brought these ideas to the city commission at their meeting, the first meeting after the mayoral recall vote. And later in that meeting, Commissioner O'Donnell suggested to the other commissioners, why don't we move forward on these, try to get them on the March special election ballot because we already have, uh, you know, we're already gonna be paying for an election. Um, the other city commissioners and Commissioner McGriff, I apologize if I'm putting your words in your mouth, please let me know. Uh, but the other commissioners didn't comment directly on these ideas, but they were very clear that they wanted to see a public process, that there may be other aspects of our uh, charter that need revision. And they were uh, considering that this topic should be in their late February goal setting session um, to uh, find out how much of, you know, figure out how much of a priority these might be. And long story short, and I apologize for how much I talk, that's why I'm here tonight. I am hoping that, and again, this is not to get to a solution, it's to get the process started and possibly get revisions on the ballot for all the citizens of Oregon City uh, to decide. What I'm hoping is that the CIC will authorize your chair, uh, Chair LaSalle, to write a letter to the city commission encouraging them to begin a public process as soon as possible with the possible outcome of uh, proposed charter revisions specifically related to these two ideas or other ideas that might come up in the process so that those items can get on the ballot in Oregon City for the voters to decide as soon as possible. And um, that's all I have at this point. If anybody wants to ask me any questions, uh, Chair LaSalle, I don't know uh, how you want to go forward on this, if you want to just um, leave it there, but I'm, I'm, I'm really hoping that, uh, that the CIC could take some sort of action tonight authorizing Chair LaSalle to write that letter. Um, because then with your February meeting come on, coming up in early February, there could still be a letter to the city commissioners if the CIC decides to go ahead with that, a letter to the city commissioners prior to their goal setting retreat. And I think that would go a long way if the commissioners hear from CIC, this is important to our CIC, this is important to our citizens, we need to move forward right away. Thank you. A questions, please, from anybody. Dee Dee, I see your hand up. I've listened to um, this talk about this concept a couple of times and I've seen it in other um, areas. Um, this is something I'm fully supportive. So um, I, I would like to have a have discussion and maybe even run a motion on it for tonight. Propose a motion so we can second and vote. <laughs> 
I'd like to okay. make just a comment um, about the city committee appointments and talking to Mike uh, and him back and forth. His uh, concern was possibly, well, I suggested that the, the uh, appointments to all the committees and boards and whatnot be done by the entire city commission rather than just the two that he mentioned. His concern was the time involved from the city commission in regard to interviews and so on. But if the prior procedures were followed, they wouldn't have to conduct any interviews because the interviews would be conducted by the individual committees. And then the committees would offer their opinions or advice to the city commission. So the city commission would not be involved in, in interviews. Um, in my uh, experience, uh, in the past, very rarely has the, the mayor chosen other than what the committees had represented or recommended. So I think that that issue would not be a consideration. Any other comments? Yeah, I have, a comment. I have a comment. I just said, I heard Mike present this in a couple of different um, committees and that, and the reaction from people have always been positive. So I really think it's something that would be good for the city and good for our representation in these situations. I'm completely behind it. Okay, any other comments? Amy? Yeah, Bob, this is Karen. Go ahead, Karen. I, I, I'm actually curious myself because Wednesday night, the city commission on the agenda has committee and commission appointments um, with no attached list of who is going to be approved and appointed. I checked my mail yesterday, I hate my mail, um, but I haven't gotten any confirmation as to whether I am or am not reappointed to the Parks and Recreation Committee. Um, just sent an email off to Katie to double check. Okay. Um, I don't know how to respond to that. I don't. I don't recall. Um, hey, Bob. This is this is Tony. Can I try? Yeah. Go ahead, Tony. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, well, Karen. Obviously, so <laughs> a little bit of a unique time, right? Um, usually, at the first meeting in January, the mayor makes the appointments per the charter direction. Um, there is no mayor, obviously, at this point. Uh, the commission president assumes those responsibility until there's an election of the mayor uh, at a later date. The commission president currently is Commissioner Lyle Smith. So I think uh, Commissioner Lyle Smith is making a determination of, of who to appoint um, and will make that decision. Um, what complicates it is that the commission president is elected by the commission at the first meeting in January for one year. Um, so, you know, at the meeting on Wednesday, um, the commission will be, con will, will be electing um, a commission president again. Um, so there's just, you know, the, I think the recall and the timing of it has just complicated the process um, a little bit. So I think Commissioner Lyle Smith is working through what she'd like to do as commission, as the current commission president. Um, you know, I guess the other thing I would I would point out that um, I would fully expect that every one of the current city commissioners would want to be involved in a process to which they're appointing people if they're going to be expected to be voting on that. Um, I don't think maybe, you know, I, I would expect that they would want to be involved in that interview process rather than just take recommendations. Um, I could be wrong and you know every commissioner is different and every elected commission is going to be different. Um, I understand where folks are coming from and I appreciate Mike's uh, points and what he's what he's bringing forward. Um, you know I, I, I'd be interested to look back in time 
you know, I've been through multiple commissions and mayors. Um, you know, this all started with the mayor and the department head and the chair of whatever committee or board it was would do interviews. Um, for those of you who've done it more recently, it's a little awkward, you know, doing public meetings to interview people and then vote on who you like and don't like uh, as recommendations. Uh, when Commissioner or when Mayor Neely came in, he changed that and asked that the each committee or board be involved in that process and bring recommendations forward to him. I'm pretty sure if I'm recalling correctly, he approved every recommendation that came forward. But once again, I'd have to go back and, and do the research on that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting how it's evolved with different mayors. Um, you know, I think one thing to consider is that, you know, you're, put, you know, depending on how elections go, you know, you could certainly end up with contentious votes on people being nominated for boards. Um, I'm not sure if that's any better or worse than having the mayor appoint. Um, but I'm not sure that every vote for every position moving forward is always going to be 5-0. Um, so just a couple of thoughts, you know, we were asked to, you know, this was brought up as well. And um, on the other issue of voting on um, the top two, you know, I'm not really sure, uh, you know, that you know, I was kind of asked on the spot what the pros and cons were. I'm not sure what they are. I mean, Mike brings up, Mr. Mitchell brings up some good points. Um, you know, another way to do it is like the county does it. Um, you know, you run in, 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 in May, and if you don't get 50%, the top two run off. Um, you know, but I don't know that there's, uh, um, I, I don't know that I have a very strong feeling one way or the other as it relates to um, what Mr. Mitchell's proposing. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to, as uh, a long-winded answer for trying to address Karen's question of if she's been notified yet and why there's nothing on the agenda on the sixth yet. Okay, Tommy. Uh, um, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing. Nope. Sorry, you got me. It's Karen. Um, this procedure for the last four years has basically been public interviews by every committee and commission. And the mayor makes appointments. Our appointments expire December 31st. After January 1st, whoever is mayor or acting mayor, at this point, based on past procedure, should be responsible for making those appointments. I've watched the commission meetings. I've seen the discussions about letting the other commissioners watch and weigh in on the decision. Please, God, this is the one and only time we have to go through this. But to me, prior procedure means that the acting mayor makes those appointments and Wednesday night confirms those appointments. Well, the, the, the appointments come official when they're made. They don't, there's no other action necessary. Um, you know, this, I think, I think this was one of the things that happened um, that, that came up with the mayor's appointments on the last day as well. I mean, there is, there's no requirement that it's done or confirmed. Um, once they're made, they're made. Um, I'm not sure if that's answering your question though, or if you had more, if you were making more of a statement. Bob, okay. can I uh, uh, jump in? Go ahead. Anyway, I, I could barely hear you, Karen, but I think I caught most of what you said. So I, I think to respond to, to Mike that, that unfortunately, I, I understand what you're talking about. And unfortunately, until the last person that was elected mayor, um, there was sort of a, a, a process that was more equitable. And then somehow or another things got off the track. 
And I understand why you're suggesting that. Um, I know that my the other commissioners um, hopefully have all weighed in at this point because we sat in on, or we actually zoomed in on the interviews for the Planning Commission and the Historic Review Board. But I am aware in the past that there were appointments to advisory committees that were not approved even though the people were qualified for political reasons and that's not right either. So we have to be careful about, you know, what is the problem we are trying to solve and, uh, you know, are we correcting one person's um, bad acts and binding other people, but I, I don't fundamentally disagree with you. So I'm just saying that we had a, had a situation here recently where there were problems with people applying and people not applying because they knew they weren't going to get appointed because they there was some vendetta against them or some some sort of kerfuffle. So you you have brought up an excellent point that we need to take into consideration. But I think the other thing we have to bear in mind is that even if we were to get all this stuff together and and get it uh, to to the county clerk, she could make the decision about whether it goes on the May ballot or not. I mean the March ballot. So she did that with the election. You know, people wanted the recall election on the same ballot as November the, the, the 3rd, but she said, no, it had to be different. So it's kind of out of our hands. And I think the deadline is coming up in like a day or two beyond that ballot. So I think your request is timely. I just don't think we're gonna make it for March. And I, Bob, can, I, also, I, also wanna, I also wanna clarify, I'm not, I'm not taking a position or a side on this. I'm just trying to provide some history um, I, you know, and, and why I say that is um, right, wrong, or indifferent, right? If I'm recalling correctly, the previous mayor, I, I believe that, the, that there were a hand, two that were not appointed and it had to, and his justification was that they were suing the city or had been in litigation with the city or, you know, so, and I'm not, I'm not taking sides. I'm not saying right, wrong, or indifferent. That's why I think it's just you know the the history of it is um, has actually from what I from what I've seen has worked. But it only works when everybody works in good faith. Um, right. Well, I you know I I have to jump in at this point, uh, Tony. That a person having a lawsuit against the city had no bearing whatsoever on the former mayor's appointments to committees. And I can talk personally of that. Um, in regard to- oh, oh, Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, sorry. In, in regard to the commission position numbers in the voting process, I've talked to people, I'll say quote unquote in the, in the know, <laughs> uh, apparently there is no reason for the commission just position numbers except for the voting process. There's no uh, position number related to the committees that they're appointed to or anything else. Right. No, there's not. Yep. Bob, can I just, we're, this is under public comment and we've gone on for a long time. Yeah. So I propose in the, in order to get through the rest of the meeting that it sounds like this is a good topic. Maybe we could put it on our next agenda, but I think we, you know, need to move on. If... I, I believe you're right. The, uh, this is such a involved subject that I don't think there's any way we can get it on the next ballot. Chair, uh, Chair Russell, can I speak for a second? Yes. There's no way it's going on the March ballot um that 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 ship has sailed um i think the urgency here to me is if the cic weighs in on this prior to the commission's goal setting retreat so that the commission realizes this is a hot button for citizens in oregon city and and again i would just say um it it isn't to me, it isn't complicated because I, certainly I suggested what I think would be better. But the bottom line is I want to start a public process. And whether it ends up being 
uh, all boards and commissions or whether it ends up being two, that comes about after the end of the public process, wh whether there's a, an ad hoc committee, uh, online surveys, whatever it is, and then whatever comes out of that, that's what the city commission could decide to go on the ballot. There's no way um, that I think uh, the CIC or me or any, you know, any should decide exactly what that's going to look like until there is a public process. And so to me, it, it would not be complicated for the CIC tonight to authorize Chair LaSalle to write a letter, which you can, re suggesting this public process, which you could then at your next early February meeting, edit, approve or not, and then that could still get to the commission before their goal setting retreat. And the other thing, I, when I was looking at my notes, um, Tony's shaking his head. It sounds like maybe that timing doesn't work. The, 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 retreat, the, the retreat's January 29th and 30th. I thought it was late February. No. no. Oh. Um, when, one thing uh, Mr. Conkle said that, that I meant to say, uh, and an advantage of, to me, of one list is that I think that takes out the possibility of it ever becoming a personal attack between two candidates. If you're on one list of people and you're running against hopefully three, four or five other people, there's no way anybody's gonna be able to launch a personal attack on everybody else on the ballot. They're gonna to have to make it about what they think is right for the city uh, and make it about themselves and, and their priorities. Uh, that, that's just, Another idea. Sorry, Mike. I'm gonna I'm gonna call an end to this part of the conversation. In any case, I would not feel comfortable signing any kind of a letter without further discussion from the CIC. So I'm going to take Amy's suggestion and put this on the agenda for next month's meeting for further discussion. Um, unless anybody has objections to that process. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much, Mike, for this uh, presentation. And it's uh, going to be an interesting topic, to say the least. Okay, the next issue is the minutes. We have to approve the minutes of March 4th, 2019, and the minutes of April 1st, 2019. Uh, does anybody want to put a motion forward? I move to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Dennis, please take the roll for the vote. Barkley Hills, Didi. Are we are we on board here? Aye, sorry. Uh, Carla. Aye. Uh, Linda. Aye. John Keys from. Aye. Uh, Amy from uh, Gaff Gaffney Lane. Aye. Uh, is Denise here? Denise McLaughlin? No. Yes. Uh, Park Place, Steve? Aye. Bob? Aye. Uh, Karen from uh, Rivercrest? Aye. And myself? Yes. Okay, passes. The next item is the staff liaison report. Thank you, Chairman Massell. Um, and I'll thank you all for looking at almost a year and a half, two year old minutes. I think those are the last of our old minutes. So hopefully moving forward, we'll have very recent minutes that people can actually remember what happened at them. But I appreciate looking through those old minutes uh, to get us all up to date. Uh, brief overview of the staff liaison. Uh, if you or anybody else in your neighborhood association uh, boards and committees have not signed up for our monthly trail news e-newsletter, please get them to sign up at orcity.org backslash subscribe. Uh, we also put in uh, the uh, January e-newsletter a, a shout out for people looking wanting to be more involved in their community uh, to reach out to myself or Bob LaSalle and to check their neighborhood association contact pages. So this is another shout out to go to your neighborhood association contact page and make sure that all your contact information is up to date. If it is not, you can uh, send an email to myself or Kelsey McNall and we will update your contact information on our website. 
Uh, I'm working with uh, Kristen Brown and we hope to have this paragraph on every monthly e-newsletter through the spring if there's space. Uh, the, uh, I also want to let everyone know that we are moving towards having all of our boards and committees live streamed on YouTube starting next month's meeting. If you want to watch the CIC or Parks and Rec or any of our um, committee meetings, you can do that via our YouTube account for the city and you can click on that at our normal agenda section. That's going to be starting in a, in a couple next weeks, but definitely by the February CIC. The key thing is if you want to be involved in the meeting and engaged, you still need to request the Zoom link. But if you want to be a passive person watching, you can watch it live streamed um, on our city's YouTube page. I'll get back in contact with Laura Turway, our Community Development Director, about the Zoom account, and we'll work with Bob LaSalle if that needs to come back to the CIC for approval at the next month's meeting. Uh, let's see, the rest of the staff liaison, um, just your general links about how to get development applications, uh, a link to all those land use notices sent out, as well as a link for public records request. If you are meeting with a developer with a potential land use uh, meeting, you can always ask for a copy of the pre-application notes and that can be done through the public records request. And that is a link on the um, city website and that'll be transferred to the correct department. It's out of our city recorder's office. Uh, generally that is all I have for our liaison report. I know the city commission as we talked is having their uh, retreat at the end of the month and there is an online survey uh, that members of the public can uh, speak out to things they're interested in and things they want the city commission to add as their goals. And I know Commissioner McGriff can talk about that more during the roundtable update. But that was also sent in an email to all of you this afternoon. So I'm here if you have any questions. I guess no questions. Thank you, Christina. All right. Oh, real one thing. Uh, I will get a copy of both presentations to you in an email either tomorrow or Wednesday. Okay, thank you. Our next uh, item is general business. Uh, the neighborhood solicitation letter which has been changed from the last time. I hope you've all had a chance to go over it and read it. It looks pretty good to me. Any comments? I'm sorry, I didn't have a chance to look at this till right before the meeting, but I sent you and Christina a uh, edited version. I, f I found a lot of things that I would like to see changed or fine tuned. Can you share what they are, Amy? Um, can I do a screen share? I will, or verbally tell us what you or, do. Wait, you can do a screen share if you want. You just uh, use the share. Let me pull it up. All right, is that working? Yes, it is. Okay, so. Um, I can't read it. Basically, I'm like, um, I think there, I believe there's 12 neighborhood associations and not 11. Um, just some capitalizations and where we say neighborhood, I suggested we keep the verbiage the same as neighborhood associations and capitalized. Um, I believe this letter is intended to go out to inactive neighborhoods. So in the second paragraph, I just added um, encouraging you to participate in the blank neighborhood association comma, which is inactive. Um, where I said I added a sentence that suggested most active neighborhood associations meet at least quarterly and then in parentheses they are meeting via zoom or other virtual platforms as needed during COVID restrictions kind of giving maybe a thought of how you know a little bit more information of just then gather your neighbors um, and then just a few other little and then um, 
verbiage things. And then at the very bottom, uh, would you be interested in participating? Instead of saying in organizing, I just thought maybe you meant reactivating your neighborhood association and or joining the CIC. So um, that was just from the some thoughts that I Funny if you put those in there, Amy, because those are pretty much closely related to the things I had changed. <laughs> um, any anybody's comments, questions? I think that's an improvement. I do too. I agree. Okay. Um, I I would like. I guess we should take a motion to approve the expenditure of the funds for the letter as presented with changes or amendments. May I make a comment? Yes. Again, the intentions on this are noble and, and good and right and just, but I think that they are a little misdirected if they are an attempt to reactivate a neighborhood. The emphasis in this letter is more on the CIC. Well, it's coming from the CIC. Yeah. My I didn't read it that way. I didn't read it that way, William, because at the it the first it lists the talks about the neighborhood, then it talks about the C and then it asks if you're interested in participating in either. So uh, I can the see call, also the yeah. call to action is just a little weak. If you're interested, um, say you're interested, uh, as opposed to Here's, uh, and I think Amy, you can remember how much work it took to reactivate neighborhood associations. It was having a meeting and having people c come to the meeting. Now, granted, you can't offer them cookies and, and donuts uh, at, at a meeting, but we can offer them a meeting. And this, this I think the call to action on this is, is um, I don't think it's a good spending your money. If you want to spend your money doing that, I, I say go ahead, but uh, I would well, recommend against it. I've, I've, the way I remember it is I got something in that piqued my interest. Then a meeting, then a meeting is held. So I personally would uh, make a motion to approve, to send out this letter with revisions and then we can address um, I think it's a great idea to have a couple, you know, have a couple of people maybe hold the meeting for that neighborhood. But I think this is a good start that Bob's got. I would second that motion. And how much okay. does it cost? Do we have discussion now? <laughs> yes, we can have this. Karen, um, um, I'm agreeing with Amy. Um, you, you need to have people schedule a meeting somewhere where potential neighborhood association members can join and create their own leadership. Uh, this, you know, coming from CIC is wonderful, but that's not quite reactivating the neighborhood association. Um, I like Amy's uh, corrections additions, but it's also gonna mean that some of us come up with a schedule to create a meeting in that neighborhood association and invite people. Yeah, have to be the the one that like William grabbed me and drug me up. That's what we got to do. <laughs> yeah, has anybody think... estimated how much this is going to cost? We haven't uh, got any cost estimates. We've been told that would be within each neighborhood's budget. And it's just going to the inactive neighborhoods, correct, Bob? Yeah, that's correct. The four inactive. So that could still be a couple thousand dollars. Uh, Karen chiming with Amy, they probably have it in their budget still. Oh, they have it in their budgets. I'm just wondering how much they have. All whole years. Plenty, yeah. Whole years budget. This is Christina. I, I did a brief look. Um, Mailing is a little bit more expensive than a postcard. And if I remember correctly, it's about three times the postcard budget to mail it. Maybe would about two and a half times the postcard budget Would we for each for a month. For, for like the monthly, what it would take for a postcard for 
uh, a normal meeting, it's probably about two postcards worth of uh, funds for each neighborhood association. But Christina, would that include an envelope and what all? Correct. It would be an envelope and the mailing. No, I don't the envelope, think the letter, and the mailing. I don't think it would be necessary to have an envelope. I think you've just had the letter trifolded mm. and addressed without the envelope. I think that would save quite a bit of money. That could be an option. It's still more than a postcard, but yeah, that could be an option. Yeah. Right. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. I'm with Bob. That was from Karen. I I'll revise my motion <laughs> to approve the letter with edits and approve the funds to be spent to send this at the least expensive manner. I second it. Okay, it's been moved and seconded and discussed. Dennis, please call the roll. Barkley Hills, Carla? Aye. Aditi? Aye. Linda? Aye. Uh, Caulfield, John Keyes? Yeah, aye. Uh, Gaffney Lane, Amy? Aye. McLaughlin, Denise? I don't think she's there. Park Place, Steve? Aye. Bob? Aye. And myself, yes. Oh, and Karen, Karen Moore? Yeah, thank you, Dennis. Karen, <laughs> you're, you're, off, you're off this list at the bottom. I always sort of like to jump over it. Okay, excuse me. Sorry, dear, but yes, I'm an eye. Thank you, Bob. You did a lot of work on this. Thank well, you. Thank Bob. you all for approving it. Now, um, I'll have to get the letter revised again and get it off to Christina. Uh, I'll work with you, Christina, on how we get the details of this mailing out. Sounds great. You just saved me the email. <laughs> so oh, we'll, we'll talk tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, glad that's done. Appreciate your support on that from everybody. The next item is the round table. Um, let's see here. Uh, I think I'll start here at the bottom. Rivercrest, Karen, do you have anything for us? Nothing much. We're staying in phone contact with our executive committee. Um, I'm posting regularly on Facebook and next door. It doesn't seem to be a lot going on at the moment, but we have not met uh, since last March. <laughs> End of report. Okay, thank you. Park Place, Steve. Well, nothing happened in December. We've got a uh, steering committee meeting via Zoom scheduled for January 18th. Uh, presentation by Josh Wheeler on the Park Place Urbanization Plan and tentatively scheduled the mayoral candidates will be uh, introduced and we'll have questions for them. And otherwise, it's slow going at this time. When was Steve that you're doing the mayoral? That's that's also on January 18th. Are we invited to that? Do we have a everybody's invited? I don't know. It's going to be via Zoom. So if you're interested, um contact Lisa Novak. Con contact Lisa. Okay, thank you. I'll do that. Okay, thank you, Steve. Caulfield, John. Well, December happened, Christmas existed, I guess, so that went through. Um, COVID's lasting a lot longer than we uh, kind of expected, so we have to look at some of the Zoom stuff to try to do something to get more people involved in what's happening. Um, I do have one question. There's a property, um, um, 213, Malala. We had someone present to us to have a parametric pediatric clinic put there. Then we found it wasn't part of our neighborhood, it's part of Gaffney Lane. And they, they said it was going through. And now I see a for sale sign on that property. Did that fall through? Did that change? Do we know? Hey, so, hey, John, they have not turned in for a land use application. Okay, so they're just gonna sell the property and first come, first serve? Uh, I don't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> that was interesting. 
Yeah, we had a, we had a request. We're going to have to get with a, a group that wants to add a, a large uh, multifamily unit uh, off Maple Lane. So if that grows and gets around, I'm sure you all hear about it. They're only about 171 units from a, from a studios to three bedrooms. So it's quite a huge unit. We'll get some information on it, but I'm sure if it continues for us, we'll all hear about what's going on and uh, have something to say about it if it gets that large and gets through. So uh, right now that's what we have. It's just that, um, well, welcome Robert again. Bao Chow, he got approved to the CIC, so he's part of the Caulfield Neighborhood Group now. So Good. yeah, a lot of people know him from before. He ran our, our neighborhood for a long time. So that's what I got. Okay, encourage him to attend our meetings. He's on. Well, he's here with us today? Yes. Oh, okay. Welcome. Hi. Hi, Bob. I've just been silent. <laughs> I've just been silent in the background watching you guys. Excuse me. We would have included you. That's okay. That's quite all right. Do you go by Robert or Bob? Uh, prefer Robert, but uh, just don't call me late for supper. <laughs> That's the way I am, too. Okay. <laughs> and the next uh, one is Kanima from Dennis or Linda or both. You want to go, Linda? Go ahead, Dennis. Uh, nothing, nothing <laughs> has happened. <laughs> we, we're, we're staying low and safe. <laughs> okay. Uh, Barkley Hills, Carla. I'm going to have Dee Dee speak and give you an update. Well, I will step in. Um, Bar uh, Carl will probably uh, do our minutes, but we had um, a bit of an upset with the electric lettuce um, dispensary at the top of the hill. There was a, a, a grouping of trees that were removed and it really, really angered a lot of the, the neighborhoods. For one thing, it's just ugly. And then in doing that, we were told, and I'm not for sure because I don't, that there was not a permit um, gotten for the removal. Now it was requested because this is their second offense. And the first time I went down there and electric lettuce said, no, it was the landlord that removed that giant tallest fir tree that was in Barkley Hills. Um, but this, this one was all the street trees that's on their property, but it comes down McLaughlin, um, Molala and over on, is that Warner Parrot that comes around that corner? A lot of them were just um, hybrid trees, but there were two very significant pin oaks that were removed. You know, one had kind of an ugly branch on it because it had been damaged during a storm, but nothing that, in my opinion, that couldn't have been pruned out. Um, do they have to get a permit? And wasn't that part of a design back during the day of allowing that corner to be built when it was the pizza parlor? Uh, we just, uh, we're losing our canopy and it just looks like hell up there with all those wires and, and going up through McLaughlin and, and if there is a fine, this is the second offense. And if they can oppose a fine, pay up. This is just, it just, it's awful. We're losing all of our canopy. Um, there was a lot of, a lot of discussion about it. So I'll leave it at that. Can, can somebody tell me if there's permits and if there's a fine and what the repercussions will be? They said they're going to, they said they're going to request smaller trees to put in, by the way, because they said leaves were getting on their customers' cars. I will leave it at that. Hey, Bob, uh, ahead, can I give an update? I was hoping you'd, I was hoping you'd uh, come in on that one. <laughs> so there is a current uh, code enforcement process and we're reaching out and we're just having initial conversations with the property owner. So I don't have any more updates as of now. Just to let you know, he's very quite savvy. I mean, he knew what he was doing. He, he got a, all right, I'll just leave it at that. I just think that there needs to be more um, repercussion for just having something done. Um, for something that I know is a design flaw, a design part in our planning. Okay, stop. Christina, is there a permit required if it's on private property? 
there potentially could be permits required for street trees and for landscaping for private commercial property. We're working through those issues right now. Okay, thank you. Um, next up would be Denise McGriff. Am I, am I speaking as a city commissioner update? Oh, yes. No, 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 no. You'd be a CIC rep. Well, I'm not a CIC, I'm, I'm, a, I'm not a CIC rep, but I did get a text from Denise Beasley who asked me to report out for McLaughlin if you want me to do that. Uh, Denise, I'm looking at my phone, I didn't realize it was her. Denise, you can, as always, speak on anything you want to speak about. Okay, well, I'll speak on behalf of Denise Beasley very quickly. If you give me a second, I can read this. So she says, um, sorry, she can't attend. Uh, she's uh, excused absence. She says that the McLaughlin neighborhood will be meeting on January the 7th via Zoom. It's the steering committee uh, and partially general meeting. They will be having, um, excuse me, it's the general meeting. They will be having a election of their new steering committee and election of officers. And they will also be getting a report Thank you, William, from um, Clackamas County Fire District number one, who's going to be a regular participant at their meetings. There will also be a report by uh, Sergeant Justin Young on what's going on uh, with the police department. And then there'll be an update on the McLaughlin sign topper uh, program that they're working through it was an enhancement grant. And then um, also a brief discussion about the um, compatibility project that Kelly was talking about. And that's all she says. Thank you. Now from you. Ed. Okay, and for me, um, so as you know, um, I took over for Rachel Lyle Smith. And as I said, this is my third tour of duty with you all. And I'm, I'm very happy to be back, um, being able to meet with you. Wanted to add a couple of things. So um, it's already been talked about, but yes, we are having a goal setting session at the end of January and already the list is this long. So if you have more things that you would like to suggest, um, we are happy to hear it. Um, you can also reach out to me directly, um, either via my city email or those of you that have my personal email, feel free to email me there. Uh, we also, as you're aware from the newspaper, got some uh, re revised committee assignments. Um, I'm going to be representing the City of Oregon City on the Oregon City Westland Pedestrian Access Committee that uh, Vance reported on. So if you have any thoughts about that, please let me know as well. Um, I also, you know, CIC, um, I'm still representing the city on the Downtown Oregon City Association Board, as well as Willamette Falls Heritage Coalition or Heritage and Landings Coalition. I hate their new name. So too long. <laughs> Uh, so I'm still representing us on that. Um, I'm also still the uh, alternate for the Metropolitan uh, for Metro. Uh, Rachel is the primary and thank goodness she's never missed a meeting. So, so far I haven't had to go. Uh, and uh, also be involved in some other things. Um, a couple of things that I'm interested in, in doing after the first of the year is reaching out to uh, the new county commissioners. Uh, we had started a process with them for um, getting together and having discussions about our mutual interests, including what they plan to do with downtown, uh, downtown courthouse. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna still work on that just, you know, to reach out. Uh, the other thing is that um, please, um, if you are going to have a neighborhood meeting, please invite me. If it doesn't conflict with city commission meeting, I will be happy to attend and provide you any information that you might need. Uh, just um, send it to, um, my city email, which is dmcgriff at orcity.org, and I would love to come, including the one that, um, did you say, is it tomorrow night, um, William, that you're having another, that you're having this meeting? So I think he said it's tomorrow, so I, I, would, I would be very happy to just sit in or attend however I can help, and all of you feel free at any time to uh, reach out by phone or email, give me a call. Um, if there's anything that you think I can help you with, and I will be very happy to discuss it with Tony. He's always very, he has a very, uh, very open door policy. And um, I really feel that uh, the city commission is 
going to be taking a lot more interest in uh, CIC and helping you guys in any way that we can. Thank you, Denise. That's very encouraging. Tony, your turn. I think Commissioner McGriff covered um, covered most of it. Um, the retreat for the commission is January 29th and 30th. Um, we're still trying to work through how we're going to do that um, in 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 the COVID era. Uh, so we'll be we'll be working on that over the next uh, week or ten two weeks or so. Um, the 2021 2023 goal setting input form. Uh, if you would like to uh, provide information, either through sending it straight to Commissioner McGriff or um, that is also available on the city's website um, under the, the right on the front page there. Um, there's a link to the form, just a pretty simple form, which I think the goals the commissioner should consider for the next two year biennium that starts July 1st. Um, we, the finance director for the city started last Monday. His name's uh, Matt Zook. Um, so not somebody you usually see unless it's uh, budget season or uh, we're moving some money around, um, but uh, he is replacing uh, Wyatt Parno. Many of you know, went over and is working with uh, South Fork Water Board now. Um, so that's really all the updates I have. Hope everyone's having a, a good, 20, new, good new year in 2021. Thank you, Tony. Uh, Christina, tell me if I'm wrong here, but I think it's now time for all the neighborhood associations to send to you the updated CIC representative lists. Uh, no, the it would be next year. It's a two-year appointment. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that's cool. Yeah. So we're in, we're in the off year. Yeah. Okay. Great. Does anybody else have anything for us? I do. I, I didn't get asked. Gaffney Lane. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's okay. Um, Gaffney Lane, I had the same question. Thanks, John, for asking about that Clackamas Community College. I had quite a few emails. I think they came to both of ours in a pre-application, and it probably just didn't go to the next step. So I'll reach out and see what I can find out, too. Um, we, uh, huh, the Malala Avenue streets, uh, we all anticipated there would be issues. Um, not too happy about the responses we've been getting from Public Works, but I'm glad they've done a great job lately of keeping us informed of things that are coming up. We've just had some issues with stop signs and other things being put up in our neighborhood that I'm not quite sure how they get approved. I've reached out to Public Works and they said, well, we got a, rec we got a request. Well, I'm just questioning if one person can request a stop sign and they put it, isn't there a process that needs to be gone through and how that all works? Because I twice now I've been told, well, we got a request and I, I'm questioning that because the last time I was told we got a request, it was an employee that requested it. So I'm having some problems with that. So that's something that we're working through. Um, I did, we are, I'm feeling disconnected. We haven't had any really land use things. So we send out a lot of emails, but trying to figure out, we're going to have a steering meeting here pretty soon because we're feeling kind of disconnected from our neighbors. I feel like I need to like put on a Santa suit and walk the neighborhood or something just to get people to, you know, interact and talk. And even though we're holed up in our houses, it would be great to do something. I don't know. We're just feeling it's January and we're ready to get out. We're ready to be outside. Um, I was wondering, Christina, could you send us an updated where we're at with our budget and also the current pricing for postcard mailings and such? I'm sure I have it somewhere, but that would be great to have a refresher because we are going to put together some kind of a hello for our neighborhood. We haven't spent any money in a while and Sure, I was um, working with Kelsey McNall right before the break and I'll reach back with her and hopefully uh, within the next week, week and a half, I can get that to everybody. Okay, I don't think we can have enough money to put up a billboard on 213, but something fun that we can. <laughs> you have more, <laughs> you have more money than- the word out. Yeah, you, you, because <laughs> everyone hasn't had, you know, monthly or not, or, you know, postcards for every meeting, there, you, you, there is a fairly large budget surplus, so there are ways to think creatively about how you want to spend your outreach money and um, 
feel free to reach out to me and I can work with Katie Riggs to see, you know, what things are eligible for spending. I was just going to ask that because I remember at one point we bought some signs, but um, is there any kind of guideline that's already in place of other ideas of things that we can do? Uh, the only guideline I received from uh, Katie Riggs, and I can double check back and maybe some things, you know, COVID wise have changed, um, you know, some interpretation, but the, the big issue is um, the city can't spend money on political speech or even the potential of political speech. And that's why we generally review the postcards before they go out, just to make sure mm -hmm. that a neighborhood's not endorsing a candidate or anything. And um, previously, website hosting was considered a little hard because we couldn't review the content. So, um, but yet Zoom meetings are okay. So I'll have a check back with um, Katie Riggs, our city attorney, and see if we have some more guidelines to give you or even let's throw a bunch of ideas out and see where they fit because that's really the key part is um, how we can we as government make sure that what how it's being used is not for political speech and so yeah. things are constantly changing that's the hard part yeah i mean during COVID, i probably can't rent an ice cream truck and go hand out flyers that say you know we miss you or something yeah but yeah something uh, wouldn't it be fun to be able to have a via you know a vehicle that had your neighborhood association on it and you're just you're handing out something somehow covid free to just keep everybody reminding that hey we're here you know yeah hey, we have a snow know. cone machine yeah if yeah. if uh if P if neighborhood associations have great ideas call me up send me an email and we'll bounce them around and see if we can spend city money on it Okay. Thank you. Anybody else with anything? Yeah, I got a quick question. I'm new at this. I'll pick on Christina first. I don't really know what to go to. Normally, the first part of the year, you put a list out of when you're going to have your meetings, which month, days, and everything. Should we do that now anyway and at least get it turned in? If we get to meet, we can meet, or should we just not do anything at all right now? I'm just not sure what to do. I, my recommendation is for each neighborhood association, Whatever you know that you want to, you know, it's really a communication talking point. So for anybody that lands on your neighborhood association page, what information do you want them to know? Contact information, you're trying to hold meetings, you hold them from Zoom, you know, we don't have dates yet or you do have dates. So whatever information you have sent to us and we can update it anytime there's new information. I think the the worst position to be in is to have outdated information. So even if you don't know when your meetings are, just send me that sentence and contact information. I can use that and update the your neighborhood association page. But make sure that if someone stumbles upon the page, they feel like the information is fresh, whatever it is. Sounds fair. Thank you. Anything else from anybody? All right, thank you. Everybody. I just wanted to One mention question. real quick um, about Barclay Hills. We're having most of the candidates at our next meeting, um, we, which is next Tuesday. I just wanted to inform we're having the new candidate, Alex. I'm gonna approach the final ca candidate who, uh, who filed today, the fifth candidate. We're having Rachel Lyle Smith. We're having Damon Maybe, and possibly the guy named Phil Hefner. So just to give you, it's next Tuesday at 7 p.m. And if anyone wants to email, they can have a link. Who was the third person? Um, it is, the third person is Phil Hefner. There is a guy named Alex Josephy, if I'm saying that right. And there is a fifth one who just filed before today at five, and I don't know their name yet. And I'm going to try to approach them. Anything else from anybody? Okay, be safe, everybody. This meeting is adjourned.